this year, uh, on the 200th anniversary of Lotter Macquarie's appointment as Governor of New South Wales, I think it's appropriate that the Benithan Lecture should have an imperial theme. Now, you may have noticed during dinner some rather striking pictures on these screens. And if you were too enthralled in conversation, there's one on that little card on the table right in front of you. Uh, that picture is part of a cycle of extraordinary paintings, five in all, produced just around 10 years after Lachlan Macquarie's death uh, in the United States by an artist named Thomas Cole. And these paintings fascinate me because they depict the life cycle of an empire. In fact, at the five paintings are entitled collectively The Course of Empire. You can see them, incidentally, the next time you visit New York, if you go to the New York Historical Society, where they're housed. The one you've got on your table is actually the fourth in the cycle. The first is entitled The Savage State, and just depicts a natural wilderness. It's always the same geographical location in each case. The second depicts farmers, Arcadia, and is entitled The Pastoral State. The third, and much the largest canvas, depicts a kind of classical emporium, uh, a marble scene of splendor and prosperity, and is entitled The Consummation of Empire. What you're looking at is the destruction of empire. And the final scene in the five is entitled simply Desolation. The message is clear. All empires, no matter how magnificent they may be, are condemned to decline and to fall. Now that's, I think, essentially how we've all been raised to think of the historical process, as an essentially cyclical one. It's an approach which has a very long tradition in Western civilization, stretching back, in fact, uh, more than 2,000 years. In the histories written by uh, Polybius, the process that he calls anacyclosis proceeds in the following order. This is a political cycle. The first stage is monarchy, the second is kingship, then comes tyranny, then aristocracy, then oligarchy, then democracy, and finally something Polybius called oclocracy, which is the rule of the mob. Something we have, of course, in Australia today. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> in Giambattista Vico's extraordinary Scienza Nuova, there's a, a ricorso or recurrence process of three historical phases in the cycle. You go from the divine to the heroic, uh, which is the feudal monarchic, and you end in the human or democratic. It's another cyclical theory of history, though, from much, much later. In the early 20th century, uh, Oswald Spengler's decline of the West offered a biological model, where civilizations were organisms that had thousand-year life cycles and went through seasons always ending in a miserable winter. Arnold Toynbee, nobody reads Arnold Toynbee anymore, but once he was a best-selling historian, it's a warning to us all, <laughs> wrote a 12-volume study of history which posited another cycle, challenge, followed by the response of creative minorities, and then came inexorably decline, what Toynbee thought of as civilizational suicide, when leaders stopped responding creatively to the challenges that they faced. And you know, cyclical theories like those remain popular to this day. I doubt if many people in this room have read any of the authors I've mentioned so far, but quite a few of you have probably read my good friend Paul Kennedy's great bestseller, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers, published back in 1987. That's another cyclical theory, a theory of imperial overstretch, as great powers overextend themselves through conquest and imperial overstretch, and that process causes their economies at home to suffer, to decline, and to bring the empire down with it.
Most recently, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, offers a final cyclical theory of history. Environmental cycles, all the way from 17th century Easter Island to 21st century China, as societies rise and exploit their natural resources, overdo it, and then succumb to natural disasters of one sort or another. With all these different cyclical theories in our minds, in our subconscious, even if we haven't read those books, I'm always struck by how that idea is kind of there in the popular psyche. We naturally tend to assume that in our time, history will also move cyclically and slowly. Think of the environmental or the demographic threats that we all love to chatter about. They do seem very, very remote, don't they? Maybe that's why we don't mind talking about them. But in an election year, who really cares or talks about the average atmospheric temperature in the year 2050, or for that matter, the age structure of the population? The cycle will take care of this while we focus on burning issues like traffic congestion in Sydney. And yet it's possible, ladies and gentlemen, that this entire cyclical framework that I'm describing to you is in fact flawed. Maybe, just maybe, Cole's artistic representation of imperial birth, growth and eventual death is a misrepresentation of the historical process itself. What if history isn't cyclical and slow moving? What if it's arrhythmic? At times, it's almost stationary, but it's also capable of accelerating very suddenly like a sports car. What, ladies and gentlemen, if collapse doesn't arrive over a number of centuries, but comes suddenly like a thief in the night? I want to suggest to you tonight that great powers, empires, are, in the strict sense of the word, complex systems. They're made up of very large numbers of interacting components that are quite asymmetrically organized. In other words, their construction more resembles a termite hill than an Egyptian pyramid. They operate somewhere between order and disorder on the edge of chaos in the wonderful phrase of the computer scientist Christopher Langton. Now, complex systems, as they're properly understood, can appear to be operating stably. They can seem to be in equilibrium for quite some time. But in reality, they're constantly adapting, evolving, mutating. But there comes a moment when all complex systems go critical, a very, very small trigger can set off what the scientists call a phase transition from a benign equilibrium to a crisis. You all know the examples. The single grain of sand that causes the whole sand pile to collapse, or the legendary butterfly in the Amazonian rainforest which flaps its wings and causes a hurricane in the home counties of England. To understand what I'm talking about, if you haven't read any complexity theory, just think of the things that scientists use the complexity theory to describe. Water molecules, as they form themselves unpredictably and yet symmetrically into snowflakes. Ant hills, I already mentioned, termite nests, complex things, but not the products of a plan the products of the almost arbitrary interaction of lots of tiny little insects. The canopy of a rainforest. All of these are authentically complex systems. Now, complex systems have certain things in common. One of them is that a quite small input to a complex system can have really huge and unanticipated changes. This is what scientists call the amplifier effect. When things go wrong in a complex system, the scale of disruption is in fact impossible to anticipate because there's no such thing 
as the typical or average forest fire. To use the jargon of modern physics, and here I do owe a debt to my scientific family, I'm the black sheep, but I always try to keep up. A forest before a fire is in a state of self-organizing criticality. It's teetering on the verge of a breakdown. But what you don't know is what size the breakdown will be. Will it be a huge and devastating conflagration or just a small, controllable fire? It's really hard to say. A forest fire twice as large as last year's is in fact roughly four or six or eight times less likely to happen this year. That kind of pattern, which is known as a power law distribution, completely different from the normal distribution of the bell curve, is remarkably common in the natural world. It applies not just to forest fires, it applies also to earthquakes, and it applies to epidemics. You may possibly have been thinking as I was talking that it also seems to apply in the realm of finance. You never quite know how big the next crisis will be. And it turns out that financial crises don't uh, follow the normal distribution. They follow a power law too. Well, what I want to suggest to you tonight is really quite interesting. I want to suggest to you that regardless of whether a great political entity is democratic or authoritarian, any large-scale political unit, like an empire or a great power, is a complex system in just that sense. And I could say exactly the same of financial systems, but tonight, let's focus first on empires. In other words, most big empires have a nominal central authority, somebody is the hereditary emperor or king, but in practice, the power of the individual ruler is a function of that network of economic, social, and political relations over which the emperor presides. Very little control was exercised over Lachlan Macquarie by the men back in London. In fact, the British Empire was a perfect example of a self-organizing complex system in which constant adaptation occurred on the periphery as the individuals made their own decisions. It was a very, very large human version of the anthill. Now, because that analogy works well, it's not surprising to find that empires share many of the characteristics of the other complex adaptive systems I've been describing, including the tendency to move from apparent equilibrium, from apparent stability, to instability quite suddenly. That is the key fact that challenges the whole cyclical theory of history, which we, for some reason or other, have grown so very fond of. Let me just give you a couple of examples. The Bourbon monarchy in France in the 18th century passed with amazing speed from triumph to terror. French intervention on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, on the side of the colonial rebels against British rule, of whom we all, of course, deeply disapprove, seemed like a great idea to the French. It was a perfect opportunity to take revenge on Great Britain for its victory in the Seven Years' War. But that decision to intervene in the American War of Independence tipped the French monarchy over the edge into chaos. In May 1789, with the summoning of the Estates General France's long dormant representative assembly, a chain reaction was unleashed that led with amazing speed to the complete collapse of royal legitimacy in France. Just four years later, in January 1793, Louis XVI was decapitated by that extraordinary machine, the guillotine. Or take another case, more familiar in the through. Take the case of the collapse of the British Empire. We tend to think of that as a rather protracted process. And much history is written as if the British Empire began declining in the late 19th century. This is quite wrong. The zenith of the power of the British Empire in territorial terms was, in fact, in the 1930s. And to Winston Churchill, in 1945, sitting as an equal at Yalta with the other members of the Big Three, with Roosevelt and Stalin, it didn't seem 
as if the sun was going to set on the British Empire on his watch. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, within just a dozen years of Yalta, the United Kingdom had given up what became Bangladesh, Burma, I still call it Burma, Egypt, Eritrea, Ghana, India, Israel, Jordan, Malaya, Newfoundland, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Sudan. All gone. The Suez Crisis in 1956 revealed the reality that the United Kingdom could no longer act in defiance of the United States in the Middle East or pretty much anywhere else for that matter. The empire was, in effect, at an end. Now, if empires are, as I'm trying to persuade you, complex systems that sooner or later succumb to sudden and catastrophic malfunctions rather than, you know, cycling sedately from Arcadia to Apogee to Armageddon, what are the implications for the United States today? What are the implications of complexity theory for today's Anglophone empire? I think the most obvious point I'm going to make tonight, the one I want you to remember, so if your attention is wandering, which usually happens in most lectures at this time, do pay attention, <laughs> is this. Imperial falls, forget all this decline. There isn't a decline, there's just a fall. Bang, off a cliff. Are nearly always associated with fiscal crises with dramatic imbalances between revenues and expenditures. And above all, here's the key idea. <laughs> Anyone nodding off? <laughs> above all, these crises, these dramatic falls, are associated with the mounting cost of servicing a huge public debt. I'm going to give you four examples to illustrate my point. Let's start with Spain in the 17th century, actually even earlier, in the 16th. Already, as early as 1543, nearly two thirds of the ordinary revenue of the Habsburg monarchy in Spain was going on interest payments on the juros, which were the loans that the Habsburg monarchy used to finance itself. By 1559, Total interest payments on these things actually exceeded ordinary revenue. By this stage, the Spanish monarchy was essentially running on extraordinary financial expedience and the returns of its silver mines in Spain. 1584, 84% of ordinary revenue going on interest payments. 1598, back to 100%. When all of your ordinary tax revenues are going on interest payments, it is, ladies and gentlemen, game over. <laughs> Think of France in the 18th century. I told you that story about the French Revolution. What you have to understand is why they called the Estates General. They called it because of a fiscal crisis. Here's the data. Here are the data. Between 1751 and 1788, in other words, the eve of the revolution, Interest and amortization payments, debt service, rose from a quarter of tax revenue to 62%. Or take Ottoman Turkey, one of the great empires of the early modern period. By the 19th century, here's the story. Debt service rose from 17% of revenue in 1868 to 32% in 1871 to 50% in 1877, which was the time of the great Ottoman default after which the Ottoman Empire in Europe, in the Balkans, essentially began to fall apart. <coughs> Finally, let's revisit the case of post-war Britain. Already, by the mid-1920s, debt charges, interest and amortization were absorbing 44% of total government expenditure. They already exceeded defense expenditure by a considerable margin. It wasn't actually until 1937 that the British government was spending more on defence than on interest payments, a very late stage indeed to embark on rearmament given the German and Japanese threat. Note also a really important kicker. 
When Britain's problems really got nasty after 1945, when the treacherous Americans cut off Lend-Lease and demanded the debts be honoured, a very substantial proportion of Britain's debt was held in foreign hands. Of the $21 billion of national debt at the end of the war, $3.4 billion uh, were owned, owed rather, to foreign investors, to foreign creditors. And that was around a third of Britain's GDP in 1945. You'll see the significance of that in a moment. So, alarm bells, ladies and gentlemen, should be ringing very loudly indeed in Washington, D.C., as the United States contemplates a deficit for 2010 of more than $1.47 trillion. That's around 10% of US GDP, and that's the second year running that the deficit has been that big. Since 2001, in the space of less than 10 years, the federal debt in public hands, that's excluding those parts of the debt held by federal government agencies in the United States, has doubled as a share of GDP from 32% to a projected 66% next year. And it just keeps going up. According to the Congressional Budget Office's latest projections, and this is using, if you're interested in this kind of thing as I am, their alternative fiscal scenario, which they regard as the more politically likely of the two scenarios they produce, the US federal debt could rise above 90% of GDP by 2020. It could reach 146% by 2030, 233% by 2040, 344% by 2050. And ladies and gentlemen, those figures do not include the vast unfunded liabilities of the Social Security and Medicare systems. Now, I rather imagine that to an Australian audience, in a country where the net debt is minuscule by the standards of the rest of the Anglosphere, these figures sound completely fantastic. But listen to me, there's more. <laughs> Even more terrifying is to consider what this ongoing deficit finance could mean for the burden of interest payments as a share of US federal revenues. And this is where it gets really cool. <laughs> the CBO projects that net interest payments could rise from where they are now, which is 9% of federal revenues, to 20% in 2020, 36% in 2030, 58% of federal revenues by 2040, and 85% of all federal revenues by 2050. My good friend Larry Kotlikoff recently pointed out in the Financial Times that by any meaningful measure, the fiscal position of the United States today is in fact worse than that of Greece. But Greece is not a global power. It hasn't been a major empire for a very long time, indeed. <laughs> I think the real point, and the point of my lecture tonight, is that in historical perspective, unless something very drastic is done very soon, the US is heading into Habsburg, Spain territory. It is heading into Bourbon, France territory. It is heading into Ottoman Turkey territory. It is heading into post-war Britain territory. The fiscal numbers I've given you tonight are bad. There's no doubt about it. But in the realm of political entities and power, the role of perception is crucial. It may be more important than the actual numbers. Because in imperial crises, ladies and gentlemen, it's not the material underpinnings of power that really matter. It's expectations of future power in the eyes of those with the power, and even more so in the eyes of their enemies. Right now, I get the impression that the world, at least the Western world, basically expects the United States to muddle through. And eventually, to confront its problems, as Churchill famously said, to do the right thing 
when all the alternatives have been exhausted. <laughs> and right now, with the sovereign debt crisis in Europe dominating uh, the headlines, at least the headlines uh, back home, and growing fears of a deflationary double dip or a recession, bond yields are at historic lows, below 3% if you look at the 10-year US Treasury. So there's a pretty strong incentive there for congressmen to do nothing and to put off fiscal reform. To say, thinking of that cyclical theory of history, this is a problem for the next generation, not for us. You know, recently I was invited uh, to a dinner in Washington to discuss radical fiscal reform for the United States. And I was quite excited, because I thought it would be like this. <laughs> I wondered which huge hotel in Washington they'd booked and which ballroom we would be eating in. Three congressmen turned up. <laughs> it's funny, except it's not funny. It's scary. There seems really, in fact, only to be one congressman who has seriously thought about how we can deal with this problem, and it's Paul Ryan. And I commend him to you as one of the few young Republicans who are prepared to talk seriously about stabilizing the fiscal position of the United States before it does go critical. The trouble is, for all those complacent congressmen of both parties who think this isn't an imminent problem, there's a zero-sum game at the heart of any budgetary process. Even if I'm wrong and my old rival Paul Krugman is right. And that is possible. I don't rule that out. Even if he's right and interest rates stay low and the bond market is in a coma and the vigilantes go off and take up some other activity. Recurrent deficits, year after year, never much less than 5% of GDP, even on the administration's optimistic forecasts, plus debt accumulation as a result, mean, inevitably, that interest payments will consume a rising proportion of tax revenue. The process I've described to you is independent of any bond market panic. And as interest payments consume more and more tax revenue with every passing year, guess what gets squeezed? Not Social Security, not Medicare, the unreformable entitlements programs. The thing that gets squeezed is that discretionary item in the federal budget known as defense spending. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a pre-programmed reality of US fiscal policy today that the resources available to the Department of Defense will be reduced significantly in the years to come. And I'm not talking about the 2050s, I'm talking about the next five years. Indeed, by my reckoning, at some point within the next decade, the US will reach the crossover point at which it will be spending more on debt service, on interest payments, than it is able to spend on defense. And remember, half the federal debt in public hands is in the hands of foreign creditors. And of that, a fifth, to be precise, 22% is in the hands of the monetary authorities of the People's Republic of China. Down, incidentally, from 27% in July of last year. Now, I suspect it hasn't escaped your notice that China now has the second largest economy in the world. And I expect you've also spotted that it is likely to be America's principal strategic rival in the 21st century, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. Quietly, discreetly, you haven't seen it in the headlines, the Chinese are reducing their exposure to US Treasuries. I believe as a result of a conscious policy decision to switch out of dollar-denominated claims on the US government and into nice, hard commodities and preferably the mines that produce them. Maybe, just maybe, 
the Chinese have noticed what the rest of the world's investors pretend not to see, that the United States is on a completely unsustainable fiscal course with no apparent political means of self-correcting. Ladies and gentlemen, military retreat from the mountains of the Hindu Kush or the plains of Mesopotamia has long been a harbinger of imperial fall. <laughs> It is no coincidence, after all, that the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan in the Annus Mirabilis of 1989, which was so closely followed by the complete collapse of the Russian Empire in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia. What happened just 20 years ago, like the events I have described to you tonight of the 17th, 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, is a reminder that empires do not, in fact, appear, rise, reign, decline, and gently fall according to some recurrent and predictable life cycle. Rather, they behave like all complex adaptive systems. They function in apparent equilibrium for some unknowable period, and then, quite abruptly, they collapse. I believe this has profound implications not only for the United States, but also for all countries that have come to rely on it directly or indirectly for their own security. This country was born, as we've discussed, and grew up under the umbrella of the British Empire. Its post-war foreign policy has been, in essence, to be a committed ally of the United States under its imperial umbrella. But ladies and gentlemen, what if the sudden waning of American power that I fear brings to an abrupt end the era of US hegemony in the Asia-Pacific region. Like changes to the climate or the population, we tend to think of such a geopolitical shift as a protracted, gradual phenomenon, very far from our quotidian preoccupations. But history suggests it may not be so slow acting. If I may return to the terminology of the artist Thomas Cole, painter of the course of empire, the shift from consummation to destruction and then to desolation is not cyclical. It can be very, very sudden. I wonder, are we ready for such a dramatic change in the global balance of power? Well, judging by what I have heard since I arrived here last Friday, the answer is no, not bloody likely. <laughs> Australians, as far as I can see, outside at least the rarefied atmosphere of the CIS Concilium, are simply not thinking about that kind of stuff. A favorite phrase in this country is no dramas. But ladies and gentlemen, dramas lie ahead, and soon, as the nasty fiscal arithmetic of imperial decline drives yet another great power over the edge of chaos. Thank you very much.